So what are the next steps on the CRR quick fix? On the parliament side, there will be a co coordinators meeting tomorrow afternoon to decide on the procedure. We want to move quickly. So either the urgency procedure under Rule 163 or the simplified procedure under Rule 52 will most likely apply. At both procedures, there needs to be prior agreement with the Council and the Commission to adopt the text with, with or without amendments. If there are amendments, the exact wording needs to be agreed with the Council. So it will be very difficult. And the number of, I think, the chance of amendments are, the chances are limited. Therefore, the room of maneuver at this stage is very limited, I explained it, but we will of course take a careful look at all issues. On the council sides, member states have submitted their comments until yesterday. At the latest on Friday, they will have a decision. The aim is to have a position by mid-May. In any case, we will welcome the Commission will start this month a comprehensive dialogue with the financial sector and other relevant stakeholders. And I would like to encourage all stakeholders to use this opportunity. Lastly, I have some three questions to our speakers from the financial sectors. First, what are currently the biggest challenges for financial institutions? Secondly, are the, are the banks still able to swiftly satisfy the demand for financing? Third, are the measures to support market liquidity enough? But first, let me give the floor to Mr. Kamper to give us an insight into the current work and priorities of the European Banking Authority. Thank you very much again, and I am looking forward to a very fruitful debate and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Vice President. Thank you very much, uh, first of all, for inviting me to this forum. I really appreciate that. Thank you to Wim and to all the organizers, and I look forward to the uh, exchange and the discussion that we'll have today. In light of the rapid increase of the COVID-19 cases globally, the only certainty is that a lot of uncertainties will remain with us for the weeks to come. This health crisis is unprecedented and the repercussions on the economy, while difficult to quantify at this stage, we can be certain that they will be severe and I'm afraid that will probably be long lasting. In contrast to the financial crisis in 2008, you know, at the root cause of this crisis lies outside the financial system and as Winston in his introduction remarks, you know, comparisons to events in 2008 from the perspective of the banking sector, the situation at this stage is widely different. Banks are today better capitalized and their capacity for loss absorption is much higher despite the sharp asset price correction that we have seen in the markets. Moreover, uh, leverage in the banking sector has dropped significantly since 2007 and the liquidity buffers of the banks uh, at the beginning of this crisis were ample. You know, and uh, central banks have continued to provide a lot of necessary liquidity in the last weeks. This time, banks are playing an important part to alleviate the immediate implications of the crisis. But at the same time, we are aware that as the situation develops and if the crisis continues for a, over a longer period of time, this will lead to challenges for many banks in terms of earnings, capital, and operations. Such an emergency situation like the one we, we lived in the past month and we continue to live today from all require urgent action from all EU financial regulators and supervisors. Now, along those lines, the EBA, I think, responded quickly and clearly and committed to provide support and work to ensure coordinated approach for EU supervisors. The key principle behind the measures that we have taken has been to find uh, the right balance between providing flexibility to support the real economy and ensuring the resilience of the EU financial sector in the medium and long term. The focus of the EBAs has been in three broad areas, and let me quickly uh, 
explain those three areas. You know, there's been first an immediate focus on operational continuity and assuring that banks will focus on keeping core operations functioning properly and serving the needs of their customers. And as it was mentioned already, mainly citizens and SMEs that may be most likely the most affected by the crisis at, at this stage. In this area, we recommended that all non-essential supervisory activities be discontinued. We also announced the postponement of, the, of our EBA stress test to 2021 that was ongoing at the beginning of March. And we have also extended the deadlines for all of our going consultations and data requests. We also gave guidance to competent authorities on the need to provide flexibility regarding deadlines in other areas of regulatory reporting. A second priority on our part has been to send a strong message that the existing regulation provides areas of flexibility and that the existing flexibility in the, in, in the regulation is there to be used. We made explicit references to the use of certain capital buffers, in particular related to Pillar 2, also to the liquidity requirements and the fact that the liquidity capital ratio, the liquidity coverage ratio, excuse me, is there to be used in exceptional circumstances. We also sent a strong message that the release of all these buffers should not be identified with any stigma by banks. On the contrary, now was the time for banks to use these buffers to provide lending to the economy and banks should also be conservative in any capital distribution and variable remuneration. In this context, we issue a recommendation that banks should retain profits and stop any planned capital distribution to assure that capital remains within the system. Those recommendations have been, I'm happy to say, they have been widely followed both by competent authorities across the union and also by banks that have followed the recommendations of their competent authorities. We have also asked banks to assess the remuneration policies and to align them with the new risk environment that we're confronting now. We have also provided guidance in the application of the regulation in a number of areas, particularly on areas of, such as the classification of defaults and forbearance and the application of IFRS 9 in loan exposures. And we publish guidelines on how those classifications should be applied in conjunction with the many measures being put in place to address the crisis, mainly by national authorities, I must say, you know, and I'm referring mainly to loan guarantees, to payment holidays, and particularly to moratoria of a general nature, whether it be private or legal nature. We have also provided regular regulatory flexibility in the areas of market risk, postponing the entry into application of some norms and also delaying some reporting requirements. We have also made recommendations in the area of payments, particularly in the adequate use of contactless payments in this situation, which you know physical contact is more of a challenge than normally. And we have encouraged payment service providers to use the maximum threshold allowed under EU law for these contactless payments. The third broad area of priority for us has been to highlight certain issues where we think that the current situation actually requires banks to be particularly prudent and diligent in the application of current and upcoming regulatory requirements. You know, in this context, you know, we include areas of uh, communications in the area of consumer protection and other risk areas like in the possible increase in cyber risk, the importance of having operational resili resilience in ICT technologies, and also to be aware of crime prevention and enhance any AML activity, since in, this, in times of disruption like this one, usually criminals tend to be more active. Now, our key message in this context was of proper conduct by banks, and particularly as banks engage with customers. We reminded banks that they should keep the best interests of customers in mind as they provide any restructuring of their financial needs. We also reminded consumers to be aware of any new hidden charges or indications of any of an automatic impact on their credit ratings without proper risk assessment. Coordination among regulators, I'm happy to say, and competent authorities in the banking supervisory sphere has been prompt, I would say has been ample, and that has helped also providing a coordinated message across the system. As an example, we at the ABA, we have come forward, as I was explaining, with a number of communications. All these communications have been always closely coordinated with all the, with other European regulatory bodies, and in some cases the communications have been coordinated and have happened simultaneously, you know, if the topics were of common interest like we did with the ECB banking supervision side or with ESMA. Now, beyond communication, we continue to monitor very closely the situation with all the competent authorities across the Union and with other EU institutions. You know, we are constantly involved and closely liaising with ESP, with the other supervisory authorities, ESMA, EOPA, with the Commission, of course, the ESRB as well, and the European Central Bank, as well as with international bodies as the, as the Basel Committee. 
We have also been assessing a number of additional requests as we go along on different areas of the regulatory framework to see if, the, if, they, if this framework needs further adjustment, as well as reprioritizing part of our work, work plan going forward. In this context, you know, the Vice President asked me on our RTS on software, you know, we're committed to bring forward this RTS by June of this of this year, you know, which was the original deadline, and hopefully that will go into effect as soon as possible if the regulatory changes that were provided, that were proposed by the Commission uh, are actually approved by the coastal legislators. Now, say certain aspects of the policy agenda need to, need to be moved forward, and software is one example. Others needed to be pushed back, and as I already mentioned, some of them, and some of them have been postponed, like the stress test or the entry into effect of the Basel agreements at the international level. But however, I think the vast majority of our work should go ahead forward. You know, as we go forward, I'm sure the demands ahead will continue to be very challenging for all of us. We need to continue our focus on making sure that the banking sector continues to contribute to the recovery consistently and properly assesses the risks it confronts and engages in proper behavior. We need to properly assess the immediate future while avoiding losing perspective that while the short term pressures are high, the challenges of having a long term stable and robust, robust banking sector remain an important priority. The long, -term challenge, the long term challenges to the banking sector that have been identified prior to the crisis, I'd like to say they did not go away. You know, if we think about technological transformation, the challenge in profitability, the challenges in the sustainability of the economy, and the emphasis on fighting crime. Those are all challenges that continue today and will continue in the future. You know, and I would say some of them have even become more prevalent today as some of those trends are likely to accelerate as we go through this crisis. Now, I personally see two particular areas of concern for the medium term, and I think that we should try to keep an eye on focus on them. First one, which has already been measure, mentioned indirectly, I think, by, by the Vice President, the implementation of many of relief support measures by governments has been primarily so far through national initiatives. This will require adequate monitoring on the impact that these diverse measures are having in the banking sector. You know, we need to identify proper reporting, reporting and transparency in the prevalence and the use of these measures, and we're working on that at ABA already. And we also need to evaluate proper compli compliance, not just with the regulatory environment, but also potential and intended effects that may be having on the adequate measurement of risks, the single market, and effective competition across the union. Second, as we move through the economic crisis, I think losses will start to materialize in different sectors of the economy, and of course, as a result of that, also in the financial system, particularly in the banking system. Making sure that the banking system remains robust, that information is credible, and the banking, and the, and the banking sector overall is stable is key. When contemplating any regulatory measures as we go forward, it will be important that the work done since the financial crisis of the last 10 years to strengthen the regulation, and in particular to assure that the risk metrics will remain consistent and provide an adequate assessment of risks in the balance sheet of banks, remain stable. The regulation needs to ensure that banks remain faithful to high disclosure standards and proper risk assessment. Only by acting this way, will the credibility of the banking sector remain high and banks will continue to perform their function adequately. Let me stop here. Thank you again for inviting me to this forum today, and I look forward to our discussion. Thanks again for the initiative. Thank you very much, Jose Manuel. Very interesting, and I must say I've been very impressed by, by the work that you've been done and doing and continue to do. If I may, before I turn to the uh, uh, the speakers of the of the private sector of the financial sector, I have one pressing question from SME United, and as they are even mentioned in the title, uh, I thought it only appropriate that Gerard Humor of SME United can pass a question to you, and it's quite an important question, and you refer to it when you talk about responsibility of the financial sector. Uh, what he says is that SME United fully support the measures taken by EBA, ECB and European Commission, but he would like to know if you have figures uh, that show that banks are indeed passing on uh, the money that they get through guarantees to the SMEs where, uh, where it should go. So are there numbers available already where you can see the proof or is that too early? I think at this stage, it's still too early to have a, a cross the union view of the assessment. You know. Okay. 
but you it's clear i think that when listening to your speech it's clear that you keep a very open eye and uh, EBA and not only EBA but also the SSM and European Commission is closely monitoring if the money ends up where it's needed, namely to restart the economy in this crisis. I see, uh, <laughs> Jose Manuel, you look kind of frozen now, but I, knowing you, I know that that, was, that you will answer that you are keeping a close watch on it. And if you re rejoin, I will. Are you back, uh, Jose Manuel? Yeah, you're not. Yeah, you. I, I think I'm back. Sorry, I got disconnected. Yes, right. no, I was, I was actually answering for you that I know that you keep a close watch on exactly this uh, to, to make sure that the financial, it, it was already in your speech, that you will make sure that the financial sector passes on the uh, guarantees and the money that they get uh, to support the economy where it is needed. Yeah, I mean, thank you. I mean, I, I got disconnected now because I was afraid of the question and I did not have an answer. <laughs> it must have been a technological yeah. <laughs> somewhere. But yes, thank you. I mean, the, the bottom line is, I was saying it's too early to have a, a thorough assessment of this, but this has been obviously the, the focus. And I think the message from regulators has been very clear that the, particularly the capital relief measures and the liquidity relief measures that were given by regulators to banks were there to be used and were there to be used to provide lending to the economy. You know, one concern that we have going forward, and I mentioned that in my speech, it's of course that uh, the support measures that have been put forward across the union are of a national nature. And that generates yeah. heterogeneity across the union. You know, and we need to make sure that we have proper assessment to one extent that's being properly that addressed, you know. Yeah, we have of course been looking at that and uh, you see that there has been many good measures and uh, in many countries and some serious uh, uh, creativity to help people, to help clients. But it is important, uh, as, as uh, the Vice President Kara said, that it is also seen in the context of a European solution, because we are not in competition here. Uh, the only way to save is the European economy as a whole, not part of it. Mm -hmm. OK, this is very can you stick around for uh, 20 minutes because then I now continue to the uh, to the industry speakers and you may get a few questions along the way. Of course, be happy to. Great. Well, as I said now, and it was very clear from the uh, introduction by Otmar Karas, but also by Jose Manuel Campa, it is clear what is uh, on the shoulders of the financial sector. And I'm proud to say that indeed, thanks to the regulatory environment and thanks to their own work, we have been stronger and closer to our clients. But now is the time to prove and to continue to prove this. So indeed, don't forget the three questions that were asked by, by uh, uh, Otmar Karas to all of you. And I uh, give each of the speakers seven minutes. But I would like to start with the uh, question uh, on, the, uh, on the infrastructure. Eli Bayruti. Because indeed, uh, literally from one day to the other, uh, there was a vast pressure on the, in a, on the infrastructure. We've heard of banks that in a week arranged 80,000 work at home places. We have seen a huge rise in payment infrastructures. So I give you the first seven minutes and please keep to, uh, to your time to uh, uh, tell us how the infrastructure handled this and if you see any dangers. But again, going back to the question of cars, are there obstacles to doing what we need to do, that is to support the economy? Eli, you have the floor. Eli? Hello? Eli? Uh, Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you, Aidan. Okay, I've been muted. So for the, now, for the, I'm for the guy who has to talk about infrastructure, this is a very worrying start of your speech. <laughs> exactly. No, th thank I, you very you, much. You did hear my introduction, I hope. I did, I did. Okay, I, I heard you everything. You have the floor, sir. Thank, thank you very much for, for the invitation. Um, so I, I'm here on behalf of EPIF. As most of you know, um, EPIF is the European Payments Institutions Federation that has been founded in 2011. And we have several business models um, that are members of the association. I'm mentioning this because 
it's important to know like when you have three party card schemes, e-money providers, e-payment service providers, money transfer um, operators, acquirers, and many others, you know, it's, it's, we've been really um, very, very much in the first line here to deal, you know, with consumers and, and businesses in this crisis in the, in the online, online world. Um, our priorities through, through this difficult time has, have been um, protect consumers, employees, and also, you know, the business. So as most of our members are, are global companies, we've seen Asia is about two or three weeks ahead of Europe in terms of the economic impact of, of the virus. And thus, we have some lessons also that, that we could learn from that. We've seen actually um, a psychological impact of the of the virus and a lot of behavioral changes of of consumers. What 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 we see right now is that recovery may be slow, um, even as restrictions are are lifted, but consumers will likely hesitate before returning to their usual shopping and spending habits. So, given this reality, I think e-commerce has proven to be essential for both consumers and businesses. So in, in the few minutes that I have, you know, I will focus on how we supported businesses and consumers by ensuring e-commerce is functioning smoothly. And to do so, you know, I'll be um, in particular highlighting three topics. The first one is operational resilience. Then a second one that also Jose Manuel mentioned is contactless and the importance of contactless payments. And last but not least, you know, I'll, I'll mention um, the importance of strong customer authentication rules and how we deal with these rules for the future. So let's start first with operational resilience. I think as, as, as you hinted uh, to Wim, our industry has shown an amazing resilience. Um, consumers are satisfied by the way, you know, they were able to continue shopping online, which was really essential. And, and let me here mention a recent study by one of our members show that 56% of consumers have used a new online payment method since the start of COVID-19. So this is, this is just, I mean, amazing in terms of, in terms of the number. Um, some of our members had also, you know, to very fast readapt to the closure of physical location um, and new customers onboarding, which, uh, which, which had to, to, to become digital. And this is why we believe like this is also a learning problem for the future is that the, the, the approach of digital onboarding um, and EQYC needs to be accelerated. We know like the, 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 the the institutions were making progress, but this needs to be accelerated, we believe. Let me now move on to, to contactless payments, because contactless payments have been super important um, during the current crisis. Um, customers are turning to contactless payments as a way to pay for everyday purchases now. Also, recent studies show that contactless transactions grew twice as fast as non-contactless transactions, especially in the grocery and drugstore categories. So this is, I think, super important to know. Um, as, as Jose Manuel also mentioned, so at the beginning of the crisis, most card schemes and issuers increased the contactless card limit to 50 euros, which is the maximum allowed right now by law. And before the crisis, to give you just an idea, these limits were between 20 and 30 euros. So this allowed consumers to have larger transactions without touching a keypad and hence mitigate you know, the risk of contagion by reducing cash usage and shortening the time at the, at the point of sale. Um, but what is still needed? Is, is it all? Is that enough? Um, we believe like there is something that, that still need to be done and that's we, we would need the help of, of, the, of the legislators here or the EBA. It's to increase the cumulative threshold. As, as most of you know, there is a cumulative threshold for contactless transactions, which is currently set at 150 euros. In the in the RTS in the regulatory technical standard, and we believe you know this needs to be increased a bit further to allow for this uh, flexibility. Let me leave you when we talk about contactless with two with two numbers um, that, that show the importance of this of this um, of this category of payments right now. So recent consumer surveys we've we've, um, we've done show that more than 80% of respondents view contactless as the cleaner way to pay. And this, while more than 70% state that they will continue to use contactless payments post pandemic. So this is not, we don't believe this is something that is only um, happening right now, but we see this continuing in the, in the future. 
Last but not least, let me, uh, let me focus on the impact of SCA rules on future transactions. So today, nearly 80% of all e-commerce card transactions are processed as what we call it straight to authorization transaction. This means that once you have the authorization, the, the transaction is directly, the directly processed, which, which, is, you know, which is seamless for consumers and this, this runs very, very smoothly. As of the end of this year, all of these transactions will need to meet the new SCA requirements. As most of you are aware, you know, there are many participants in the payment chain, issuers, card schemes, acquirers, merchants, and several other stakeholders. We also, you know, let's recognize like the implementation of SCA rules has been already extended until the end of this year um, and is progressing well, I would say, across Europe. Nonetheless, the current crisis has put an extra challenge to meet the requirements um, in time, and many merchants actually are still slow to adopt the appropriate technical solutions that would allow them, you know, to be compliant with uh, with these rules. And namely, here it's the standard called 3DS Secure. Um, the abandonment rate of transactions for cards is up significantly in Europe, and this is likely to increase at the end of this year, around Christmas and the new year, when you have, you know, a lot of transactions happening. And much of this is due to IT, IT legacy issues uh, in general. So the current SCA timetable does not reflect the realities also of the travel sector, which is characterized in particular by many, many more intermediaries in the payment change. So this is also very, very challenging for, for our industry. So to, to sum it up a bit, um, the ex these exceptional circumstances of, of COVID-19 and the need for operational resilience and system continuity, this is putting, you know, a huge strain on the limited IT resources for, for all parties involved in this, in this famous change, and especially on, on merchants, which here we're talking about, you know, the small, the small businesses that we want to protect. So this is why, um, you know, our members, as well as 10 other cross-industry associations, are, have urged, you know, EU poli policymakers, you know, via, via a letter that, that we sent recently to be flexible in their approach and not to take any risk of negatively impacting e-commerce during these challenging times for society. So we really hope that this is this call, like e-commerce has proven super important for, for consumers and small and medium-sized enterprises, merchants. So let's just make sure, like, um, this is continuing to work well, smoothly, and securely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eli. And it is indeed uh, the ambitious digital strategy of the uh, of the Commission plays right into this. Uh, and because indeed, people do not want to touch. They like content contactless. They want to have s s quick and secure payments for their online payments. And also, I would say, data in the cloud will uh, get uh, reiterated and will go stronger and faster. Something else that should go stronger and faster and uh, is the Capital Markets Union. And I am a, a big supporter of that because I always believe that uh, Europe needs its own deep and liquid capital markets. So I would like to now quickly pass uh, to Ed Cook uh, the, of BlackRock, who will use his seven minutes to uh, tell us how the capital markets and the Capital Markets Union can work for us, can work for businesses, and can work in recovery, and how it could also also uh, help in getting uh, maybe getting access and capital uh, to small and medium-sized businesses and corporates in the recovery of Europe. Ed, you have the floor, and seven minutes are yours. Uh, thank you, Wim, and uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to come and address you today uh, at an important time for Europe. Um, whereas banks in the last crisis were the Achilles heel for Europe, today they, they could well be its emancipator this time round. Um, thanks to um, the large growth in deposits um, and, and relatively small uh, loan growth, we've seen that the bridge between banks' assets and liabilities come down from 3.3 trillion in 2008 to 450 billion, which is largely manageable in, in wholesale financing markets. The second aspect is that uh, Europe has a very much shallower and less complex capital markets. Um, so bank borrowings account to about 80% of, uh, of total credit extended. 
investment grade borrowing is about 16 percent and uh, leverage uh, loans and high yield uh, amounts to about four percent. This is juxtaposed to the United States, which is around um, 19 percent bank finance, 56 percent bank if financed in the investment grade markets and 25 percent financed in the high yield markets. So the great corporate liquidity bridge, um, which we're talking about as a result of this dramatic fall we've seen in, in company sales, um, is, is solved for in the short term by the, the five trillion of undrawn bank facilities that exist in the system, as well as additional support forms in the ECB TLTRO program. Um, there's also a, an active bond buying scheme by the European Central Bank to further support the public capital markets. Um, and the critical issue is that, unfortunately, the starting profitability of European banks uh, is much lower than its US peers. And so the challenge, it may be that it, it, the banks are, are less front footed in extending new credit lines um, uh, outside of the government support schemes um, for fear of, of the, the loan losses that, that might come by. What we have seen from conversations we've had with several of the banks is we have seen that credit expansion. We estimate that it's probably to the tune of sort of 20 to 30 percent in new credit lines. However, it's much less important um, the absolute size of the increase, but the velocity of circulation of the capital. What do I mean by that? Essentially, businesses are going to banks for immediate liquidity. And then the role of the capital markets um, conventionally is for banks and the, the companies to then refinance those um, bank loans in, in longer term borrowings in the capital markets. Um, and so whilst we've seen short term spreads spike um, and new issue concessions rise, um, we it's important to remember that the average duration of a European corporate is around 10 years. So even if you reassume that they have to refinance 100% of their debt in the capital markets today, most European companies will be um, booking net interest income savings um, at these lower uh, levels of uh, financing rates. Um, and for context, uh, triple B uh, credit spreads have really only retraced levels that they were trading at in January 2019. There is a real risk that lies given that half of the uh, stock of a debt that sits in the capital markets is triple B rated and there's ever a risk of downgrades. Um, there's a there's a, uh, an ever growing spread between uh, investment grade and, 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 and sub investment grade, what we refer to as fallen angels. Um, that that accounts, as I said, to about 50 percent of the investment grade market in Europe. Um, now, clearly, what we've seen from um, uh, certain central banks is they've shown some pragmatism to not create a balkanization of sub investment grade and investment grade markets by selectively participating in, in, in both parts of the market. Um, and what we've seen has actually been very, very uh, remarkable. The capital formation process has worked. Uh, on average in Europe, you tend to, over the course of last year, you see um, about 26 billion euros of financing um, being done uh, in, in the investment grade markets. Um, that number in the last two months has gone to 47 and 61 billion. So you've seen the capital markets act as a shop absorber to be able to finance up to 180 to 230 percent of the, the average monthly um, uh, debt that, that, uh, that comes to the primary markets. Similarly, if we move to the equity markets, that has also been functioning. A total of four and a half billion euros have been raised by capital from companies that are looking essentially for three things. The first is liquidity bridges, where injecting capital gives them access to additional um, banking facilities. Uh, or additional access to liquidity from the government support schemes. The second has been um, companies that have raised capital to protect their investment grade credit ratings to continue to have access to the ECB commercial paper scheme, um, as well as um, to continue to have uh, commercial access to, to banking lines. Uh, the last is, has been uh, the minority uh, compared to the prior crisis has really been around balance sheet recaps. 
Um, and, and unfortunately, the severity of the crisis has meant that there's been very little time to address companies that are experiencing structural issues or that had excess leverage. And they have immediately, unfortunately, gone directly into restructuring candidates. But we have seen some select companies that are um, uh, that have been able to reduce debt through equitization. The, 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 I'll give you three observations for the future in terms of um, how we think about the crisis um, and, and importantly, how um, we can be together with policymakers and uh, institutions like the EBA to come and address these challenges. Looking ahead, it's less about the depth of the impact to GDP, unemployment, investment, but much more relevant to the shape of the economy. This will have a bearing of whether this becomes a liquidity, whether this liquidity crisis then becomes a crisis of solvency, which would be a much bigger problem. The second is trying to anticipate, as Ellie's just mentioned, you know, the, 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 the shape of the economy as we emerge out of this. There will be structural trends accelerated, such as the move from online to off, sorry, from offline to online. Uh, and then there will be other behavioral patterns, such as um, probably more muted levels of, of, uh, uh, of business travel um, uh, that, that will also have its effect. Um, and, and, and it's important to recognize that coming out of this crisis, the shape of the economy will look uh, in some places dramatically different. The third aspect is what economists are starting to refer to as this 90% economy. And the issue is that if we, and it, and it refers to levels of consumption and economic activity not returning to pre-crisis levels. And the, the debt stock that has been injected into companies' balance sheets as a result of this risks creating zombie corporations that are not useful for, um, because are not in, have the, because they're not a, able to have the spare capacity to conduct further R&D, to invest, to make capital expenditures, to expand employment, and so therefore we need to think very hard about as we emerge out of this and we understand that the earnings picture of, of uh, the, the, these corporates, um, exactly what is the level of debt that enables the, the, the European project to continue to expand uh, and to invest in important areas of, 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 uh, of both employment and, and, and capital expenditure. Uh, and, and with that, I'll hand back to you, to, to you then. Thank you very much. Uh, you were clearly able to connect uh, everyday life and everyday economy to the capital market union, uh, to, to the uni union, and that is an important part of the discussion. It is no doubt clear that we that a new economy will emerge. Uh, indeed, if you think what it will mean for the shopping street, if people are indeed uh, very used to shopping online. Uh, but also to tourism, business travel, uh, etc. On one hand, and the um, the dependency and investment in digital means on the other. So there will be a new economy, and you will see new trends. And you were able to clearly explain to us how the capital market connects to that, and how can, how it can connect, and how it can help us uh, in uh, in in the near future. Now let me turn to Michael Lever as the last industry speaker. And actually, sir, you are very much spot on with the work of Mr. Kampa and the introduction. And indeed, this is what members of the European Parliament and all of us are also interested in is, of course, can we do it wrong or right when we implement the CRR? Are there last minute things that we need to change? How do we deal with this new economy? How do we deal with recovery? We've done many things right, but uh, are we also doing things wrong? So, Michael, please uh, take your seven minutes and uh, uh, give an overview also. And again, reminding you of the questions of uh, Vice President Karas. You have the floor, Michael. Thank you very much, Wim. And good, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, welcome. Um, to this COVID-19 seminar. I trust that um, you can all hear me. Um, as we know, a week ago today, the European Commission pr proposed a few limited targeted changes to the uh, CRR. Um, their purpose in broad terms is to make it easier for banks to help their customers 
by freeing up more of their capital to support additional lending. And Mr. Karras has, has given some indication of uh, what these measures were. And um, I'm therefore not going to go through them in uh, any detail uh, now, other than to say that I think all the measures proposed by the Commission are welcome and will be helpful, and we support their rapid introduction. However, um, we were quite surprised at the exclusion of central bank deposits from the leverage ratio um, without the mitigating compensation was something that would not be applied with immediate effect. Although the leverage ratio um, is currently a reported rather than a binding one, the market treats it as if it were one. So delaying this change for a year means that no capacity will be freed up until then, when as we know it's needed right now. So one solution to this might be to amend the reporting requirement in the CRR, but that's just a suggestion. Leaving this aside, I think the core question that we are all grappling with and that needs to be answered is, has sufficient been done so far to ensure that the banking sector has enough capacity to meet the likely demand for borrowing from the private sector? So what information do we have to guide us on this? Well, on the demand side, we know that the economy is very weak and a huge number of businesses and individuals are already under considerable pressure. The Commission, of course, is forecasting a fall in Eurozone GDP this year of 7.5%. And the ECB by between minus 5% and minus 12%. Weak growth is already showing up in these lending surveys, which point to a sharp pickup in borrowing expectations in March, with much more anticipated in the coming months. In terms of actual borrowing, the Euro statistics show net bank loans to non financial corporations of approaching 120 billion euros in March alone. Now, to put that in some form of context, this is more than the whole of the net borrowing by a non-financial corporation for the whole of last year, and is by far the highest figure for more than 20 years. So we're facing an unprecedented economic shock, and with that will come an unprecedented level of demand for financial support. So that's the demand side. What about the supply side? Well, some capacity will be produced by the impl implementation of the Commission's package of measures that we've been talking about this afternoon. However, most of the extra capacity will come from the utilization of existing flexibility in the Prudential framework. And here I must also join others in congratulating the work of the EBA, ECB, and other authorities, which has already been very helpful, and as has been outlined very clearly by Mr. Camper uh, earlier on. So to be more specific, the bulk of the lending capacity will come from banks drawing down, as instructed, on the Pillar 2G buffers and from permission to change the composition of capital held as their Pillar 2 requirement. Taken together, the ECB has estimated that these changes would free up to 120 billion of extra capital, of which 30 billion is from allowing banks to substitute 81 capital for equity within the Pillar 2R. The ECB has further suggested that this could finance 1.8 trillion euros of additional lending. But is this correct? And even if it is correct, is it enough capacity? Banks do not by and large have spare 81 capital at the moment, which could be used to replace the equity in the pillar two requirement. And raising it in current market conditions is clearly going to be far from easy. So that's a quarter of the capacity, which may not be there right now, or 450 billion of the ECB's lending figure. In addition, the 1.8 trillion capacity probably assumes that banks will run down their buffers in full. But in practice, I'm afraid that some banks are unlikely to be willing to run their capital buffers down to such an extent as they might breach their combined buffers. And this in turn would trigger restrictions, including on the payment of 81 coupons. And banks are unlikely to be willing to see this happen, especially as it would potentially disrupt the AT1 market, a raise of cost of future capital issuance. A further consideration is that even if it were assumed that the ECB's figures for additional lending capacity were a reasonable estimate, which is open to question, additional lending on this scale would be, have a very material impact on banks' leverage ratios, 
I think, a point which has not been sufficiently considered. So as a result, the leverage ratio, rather than risk-based measure, may become the binding constraint on banks' lending capacity. Therefore, co-legislators will need to measure the capacity in the system by considering the aggregate of the hire of each bank's risk-based and non-risk-based headroom in the system relative to the likely demand for that capacity. So I'll now try and pull the demand and supply picture together a bit. If we look at what governments across Europe have promised, they have in aggregate probably offered to provide partial guarantees of 1.5 trillion euros of bank lending. Assuming all this was taken up, then this alone would consume a considerable amount of European banks' financing headroom. This is before considering the very substantial undrawn facilities um, which banks will need to capitalise or other substantial non-guaranteed corporate uh, lending and personal borrowing needs, which will push overall bank capacity lending requirements considerably higher. So what we believe is there isn't uh, enough capacity in the system at the moment to accommodate the um, demand that's, that's likely to rise. Um, and that the co-legislators should therefore consider which further changes are needed now to the level one framework in, in the light of these constraints. To be clear, I think if these changes are made, they should be strictly temporary and targeted and address the current extraordinary context. I've already mentioned the need to bring forward the exclusion of central bank deposits from the leverage ratio. And there are several further possible changes which I think can be made. And given time constraints, I'll just quickly mention two. A simple change would be for the co-legislators to bring forward the existing CRR2 provisions to allow banks to, to net cash receivables and payables for unsettled security trades. The accelerated introduction of this change would help provide capacity under the non-risk-based framework in the same way as bringing forward the CRR2 supporting factors and the treatment of software assets that Mr. Karras mentioned earlier would provide headroom in the risk-based framework. Another important area for the co-legislators to consider is the exclusion from the leverage ratio of the portion of loans backed by member state guarantees. This has already been done in several other jurisdictions, most recently in the UK just yesterday. It would be consistent with the Commission's reasoning applied when extending the relief offered beyond ECAs for the purposes of the NPL backstop due to their similar characteristics. And it would also be consistent with a similar existing exemption for pass-through promotional loans, ensuring a level playing field across the EU. So to conclude, I think we all understand the urgency of completing a fast-track agreement uh, on the CRR changes, and time is very short. However, I believe that the measures currently in place or in prospect are unlikely to fully provide the capacity that the banking sector needs right now to support the likely demand for customers. So some further relatively simple, targeted and limited duration changes can still be made to the proposal and should be made to the proposal. These will be consistent both with the key objective of providing lending capacity and in many cases would mirror the actions taken in several other jurisdictions. So the industry stands ready to provide full assistance and information on these other potential changes to the co-legislators in considering all possible temporary and targeted changes that might be made to the CRR so that the banks do have the necessary capacity to provide the funding which is going to be needed as soon as possible. And that, with that, I'll conclude and hand back to Ms. you, Mr. Wynn. Thank you very much, Michael. And indeed, you did not only mention some of the obstacles that you see ahead and where the members of the European Parliament need to carefully examine what uh, needs, to be, uh, needs to be done, but you also provide some possible cures. So indeed, the problem is uh, time flies when you are having fun. So we are short for time. Nevertheless, I would like to open uh, the floor to all MEPs who would like to give statements and ask questions either to Mr. Kampa or just make a statement, because I know that all members of the European Parliament are so closely involved in this work that mostly uh, uh, they will know a direction. So please, May I invite you uh, just to, uh, to state your name and ask a question to any one of us or uh, uh, make a statement?
Yes. May I? Is that, yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hello. Uh, we have hello, Hi. everyone. Uh, Stasis Akelunas from uh, Lithuania, member of the Econ Committee. A uh, yeah. couple of statements. Uh, I think uh, Ed from Rock, uh, BlackRock uh, uh, accurately indicated that uh, if this continues, it will become the solvency crisis. And the banking system, uh, in, instead of uh, facilitating and helping, uh, could become a, a problem uh, with all the uh, implications and consequences. So I think we need to focus not only on the financial system, because this is the dialogue forum. I would uh, invite you Wim, to consider inviting someone from uh, the epi epidemiology, because the statistics, what is happening with this uh, virus, is a, is a chaos. So uh, I would propose maybe to consider inviting someone from Sweden, the chief uh, epidemiologist, and, and see how they handle this crisis. Because, you know, it could be a necessary economical and financial crisis that would, uh, that would be caused by, by, by this pandemic, which is not handled properly, I'm afraid. So uh, this is a statement and invitation. And uh, for, uh, for Mr. Kemper, maybe, uh, uh, you know, this uh, contactless payments are very fine, but uh, they're also inviting uh, others, uh, other, you know, schemers to, to abuse that. Uh, that was happening before, and uh, it's uh, more likely if, uh, if uh, the increase uh, in the contact with limits uh, continues, that could, uh, that could incentivize some, uh, some schemers, businesses uh, to, to go along and, and steal money, because that's the risk. So I think as long as this crisis continues, it's fine. But once it's gone, and, and I hope it will go on uh, quite, uh, quite sooner rather than later, then we, we need uh, to go back to protecting consumers and uh, balancing this convenience and consumer protection aspect. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an interesting thought to invite an implantologist. Uh, I have, I'm slightly biased. My, my, my wife is a, a specialist in infectious diseases. Uh, so uh, we will certainly consider that. Uh, um, Mr. Kampa, would you like to answer or uh, give any statement on this? Yep, I'll be very happy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jacquelinas. Quickly, you know, just a, a, a remark on, on what, he, what he mentioned, which I think is absolutely right on the spot. You know, there's a, there's a difficult, you always have to keep this trade off between, you know, security and convenience. And that's a difficult trade off, you know, and the contactless situation, which will provide more convenience by risking a little bit of less security. And that balance needs to be balanced. And given the, the current situation, it's probably okay to provide a bit more convenience. But overall, and if I may link this to a comment made by, uh, Ellie's from from the payments associations, you know, it comes back to the SCA application, you know, which is all about security, secure customer authentication. And here, I just want to make sure that we're clear on something. You know, the provisions from the SCA, from the technical standard, are in application right now. They've been in application since September of last year, and it's really the, that's the difficulty that we're confronted with. We need to make sure that the payments institutions. You know, are able to apply those provisions and what they're going is to migration plans that national competent authorities have been supervising and they're supposed to bring by the end of the year. But the challenge that we have here is not just the trade-off between security and convenience, it's also the fact that, you know, to provide security, the legislators have put forward a rule that's been application since September and payment companies are vulnerable to not being compliant with that obligation. And they're not now compliant. They need to be in compliance as quick as possible, extending the period is not going to allow them to not be in compliance, and that risk remains. So that trade-off between security and convenience, it's important. And as I mentioned in my initial statement, you know, we have already observed that there's been a small increase in cyber risk and other potential of risk related to digital use, precisely as a result of the crisis and the opportunities that have arisen there. So we have to be watched for that. Yeah, we work closely with the authorities on this, and you see a small rise. Thank God, mostly in fishing uh, um, uh, at this moment, but we have to be vigilant. And it's not only convenience versus security, it is also um, speed, because the faster payments go, the harder it does to uh, uh, do the necessary checks on uh, uh, in view of anti-money laundering. Uh, so there are a lot of choices to be made, and it is, uh, it's always a hard balance to strike, as Jose Manuel says. Are there other members of the European Parliament who would like to ask a question or make a statement? They are warmly invited now. Can you hear me? Yes. Francis Fitzgerald. Hi, Francis. 
you can hear me great uh, yes. good afternoon good afternoon, good afternoon everyone and thank you for your presentations i'm a an mep uh, from dublin um I, I i wanted to ask you um since the beginning of this crisis we've heard a lot about the foundations that we've put in place in the banking and financial system and, and clearly a huge amount of work has been done and there's also a lot of flexibility uh, that has been shown so far but I, without being any sort of a, you know scaremongering I, I just want to ask you if you think that if a bank was to fail a significant bank was to fail and it's always a possibility these are very uncertain times do you think the risk of contagion um, is different to before and that we'd be able to contain it I mean I know there isn't a clear answer to this but I'm wondering what are the kind of intervening factors that would come into play uh, that would avoid that. And also tomorrow, the European Commission will uh, present its um, spring economic forecast and a similar sort of question. How closely will the markets be watching that? And, you know, the economic data is, is, is very, you know, it's going in one direction at the moment. It's, it, it, it's, it's very tough. It's, it's not good. And um, we may yet not have seen the worst. And it is likely uh, that, you know, many more businesses will actually fail, as Ursula van der Leyen said at our meeting the other day. Um, and, and what do you think is going to avoid a panic like we've often seen before when you get data? And depending on the length of time of the, of the, um, of the pandemic as well, I mean, I'm just interested in your thoughts. And, and by the way, I am an optimist myself, but I'm just curious about, you know, we say so often that the foundations are so good, and they are, but like, you know, just uh, what's your gauge on the risks, nevertheless, and anything else we need to be doing in Parliament or, or anywhere else that would help? So sort of general question to you. Thank you. I'm an optimist too, but it's, uh, I think, a very good question uh, for Jose Manuel or anybody else who would like to answer. May I just have some initial remarks on this, at least? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so on, on the first point, you know, uh, which, which uh, is very much linked also to the second point, but, but let's start with the first point. You know, will there be a problem with a particular bank in any particular part of the union? I would say that's certainly a possibility, and we should not dismiss that. You know, that, they, that, that banks may be having, specific banks in particular situations, may have insolvency concerns. Our statements are across the union overall. I think that the position is much better, uh, but there's a distribution, you know, and there are weaker banks and stronger banks, and depends. And we don't, at this stage, we don't have enough information to know exactly what's the specific exposures of every single bank to specific sectors in the economy of that particular country that may be more or less affected. So that's likely to, 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 to be happen. And if the crisis, of course, which is the link to the second part of the question, if the crisis over time becomes deeper and longer lasting, the economic crisis, the likelihood of that happening will increase. And having said that, I think that the, the key component for me, is, is so that the wider effect that that ad hoc crisis may have in the system, you know, and I think there we've made progress, you know, and we have better tools than we had before, by far, you know, we have a, a BRD, the, a resolution regime that, that is, is far from perfect, but it's certainly better than what there was in 10 years ago when there was nothing, you know, uh, we have built, banks have built uh, not just rules, but also uh, instruments uh, along Emerald. To, to be able to solve from that. We have built a resolution fund, we have a resolution, a single resolution board that's there to be operative. So all that is helpful. The, the key component for me is will there be, a, which I think is what you were asking is, will there be contagion? And it is going to make this systemic. And if there's contagion, you know, the, the key component is to make sure that that contagion does not arise if possible. And it will arise if there's a lot of interconnectedness among banks. And that we are measuring, I think that's being controlled and it's being under, at least it's being under analysis. That's one aspect. And the second one, which is the one that I mentioned in my initial remarks, which I think is a key component, if there's a perception that it's just not adequate information, that the measurement of risk in the banking sector does not uh, continue to be accurate. So either because, you know, there is like a forbearance or kicking the can down the road, if I might speak, it's, it's, it's speaking in a more colloquial manner. You know, and that's the key component as we go through yeah. the crisis. As we put forward all these measures that are there to support the economy, we need to make sure also that banks perform their most important role, which is to measure risk adequately and to allocate capital along to the measurement of risks. And to me, that's the most important thing, you know, and I think that's one thing that has been built a lot in the regulation uh, that is good, 
you know, that we have that regulation that is much more risk sensitive than it was uh, 10, 12, 15 years ago, and we need to remain, that needs to remain there. That needs to remain there. In terms of the second part of your question, I think there's so much uncertainty about the macroeconomic outlook at this stage that it's difficult to, uh, to make a, an assessment, you know, of what will happen in the future. Uh, I think the key component for us is to make sure that at this stage, banks and financial decision makers in general, but at least banks, are not more pro-cyclical than needed. So that they make this assessment based on the lifetime of the exposures, based on, on good, so like objective analysis of the situation of the borrower and the outlook for that borrower over time, particularly over the lifetime of the exposure, but just over the next quarter, six quarter, or, or six months, you know, so that they have a lifetime analysis of that exposure and are able to provide for that exposure whether it needs liquidity, whether it needs restructuring of the liabilities, or whether it actually does have a solvency problem and needs to be written down or, or, or put into non-performing. That assessment, I think, is the most important aspect. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. I realize that uh, we are getting over time, uh, but I must say we've heard so many interesting and important contributions. Uh, so, but I would like to pass the floor now to our chairman, uh, Otmar Karas, for final remarks. Otmar, I think you are still around. Okay, yes. Now it's yes. working. Yes. 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 Thank yes. you very much. Thank you very much to everybody. I think that was not only a, a very interesting analyze of the situation, it, it was a big step forward uh, for our political work. And I think we have to prepare our third webinar. Uh, it is not enough what we discussed uh, today. Uh, we, ne we, we don't uh, didn't discuss uh, the, the, the decision of the Court of Justice in Germany and the consequences. I think also the consequences for the decision-making process of the whole packages we have on the table at the moment. I think that will be very difficult. Uh, the, the economic and, and the banking sector is very uh, close to the social situation in, in our in our member states, so we have to discuss a lot. It's not enough what we have on the table. We know more uh, after this week uh, when the, the Commission uh, decided uh, the, the changed working program for the future. Uh, so, see you. Uh, please prepare our next webinar and thank you very much for, uh, yes, for your support and for your presence. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you all and Bye -bye. thank you Jose Manuel Thanks. and Otmar for doing this and all of you out there there will be a new one another seminar so stay tuned and stay safe and thank you very much especially to the speakers Jose Manuel, Otmar and our industry speakers and thank you for all that who attended it have a, have a good afternoon thank, thank you very much for the invitation Bye -bye. thank you very much thank you.